Has the Lord done anything for you? Has he brought you out of a situation that you didn't see no way of coming out? Did he give you a job when, when nobody was hiring? Did he keep you on your job when the whole job, when the job was firing and laying people off? All of us got some kind of testimony that we can look back and say what the Lord has done for us. And if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, I don't know what in the world would, what would have happened to me or my family or my home or my uh, responsibilities, obligations. And for that reason, I'm going to praise him. I'm going to lead in praise. I'm praise. And no, one, no one can praise the Lord for what he's done for you like you can for what he's done for you. And today we're going to look at a lesson about Moses and Miriam. Uh, they lead in praise. And this is a pretty big deal, class, uh, because praise, there's a song that says, praise is what I do. Coming from Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, and then verses 11 through 13, 17 and 18, and then 20 and 21. The lesson is broken down into two different sections. The song introduce, that's Exodus 15, 1 through 3, and in uh, verse 1 is the recipient. Verse 2 is the re 2 and 3, the reason. The second part of our lesson is the song continued. Uh, verses 11 through 13, the law's guidance, uh, the people's inheritance, verses 17 and 18, and the women's response, verses 20 through 21. So now we're going to read the entire lesson text and then get into a verse by verse commentary. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he had triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider had he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God. And I, will, and I will prepare him an habitation. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance. In the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thou hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he had triumphed, uh, triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider had he thrown into the sea. I want you to see uh, in, in your Sunday school book, there's a picture, not this picture, but it's one that's similar. But uh, when I say similar, it says the Lord is our salvation. And class, we ought to be real glad about the fact that the Lord is our salvation. Uh, nothing uh, can compare to him. No one can compete with him. Nobody can stand against him. He is God, Lord of Lord, King of Kings, and he's over everything, and he's over everything that's going on also in every child of God's life that's in this class right now. God is in control. I want to get, get, get this, just kind of get a, a little context of what our lesson is all about today. And uh, you have it also in your Sunday school book. I won't get into 
uh, all of it, but just a, a, por a certain portion of it. Moses encountered the Lord uh, on Mount Sinai and God repeated the promise given to his ancestors and called him to lead these enslaved people, the Israelites, away from Egypt land. Exodus chapter three and verse number eight. And God worked through Moses and his brother Aaron to bring about 10 plagues that devastated the, the land of Egypt. And at that point, Pharaoh expelled God's people, the Israelites, from the land of Egypt. That's the, uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 31 to 33. It had been some 430 years to the day since Jacob and his family had went into Egypt land. This is chapter 12, verses 14 and 41. And God's people left Egypt. And when they left Egypt, they were reminded again that their destination was Canaan land. Uh, Egypt was certainly not their home. They were only pilgrims passing through. And Pharaoh then, he went on to change his mind and decided, I'm going to bring this very large workforce back to, to Egypt again. I'm not going to let them go. And the Egyptians pursued, ran after Israel all the way to the brink, to the edge of the Red Sea. And it seemed like at that time that the Israelites were backed up against the Red Sea and they had Pharaoh behind them. And it looks like at this point that the Egyptians were going to win and bring them all back into slavery. But God. Have to always remember, class, that is always a but God. And when God is in the midst, uh, everything, everything can turn on a dime. And so the Israelites then crossed the Red Sea, and they crossed the Red, least, Red Sea safely after the Lord came in and parted the waters, and they walked across on dry land. But the Egyptians, the Egyptians tried to cross the same kind of deliverance that God gave them, but they didn't have that grace and they got drowned in the Red Sea. You see, the, the God of Israel was superior to anything that Pharaoh and his people had built, those little false gods that they had built. And the crossing of the Red Sea was a really important time in the history of God's people, the, a pivotal time. And the enslaved Israelites were free. They were free beyond the hand and the reach of Pharaoh. And Moses and the people re responded the right way with a joyous praise, singing songs, Exodus 15, verses 1 through 21. And the first song in history of this new nation is a song of rejoicing because of the victory the Lord had, the Lord now had obtained for the people. Some students uh, of the song have, have created designations for this song. One was, one was a song of the sea. Exodus 15, 1, 4 through 5, and 8 and 10. One was a song of Moses and Miriam. This is 15, chapter 15, verses 20 through 21, Exodus. And then one was a song of Moses and Israel, chapter 15 and verse 1. And then the last one was a song of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 30. And that brings us now to our, to our lesson for today, to our commentary. And uh, I'm going to... I'm going to do all I can to stick with these notes because, as I often say, this lesson right here is so jam-packed, we may mess around here and start praising right here in the middle of this lesson. But the, the use of the English word that you see in the text, Lord, with all small caps, in this verse highlights that who the song was directed to, none other than the Lord God Almighty, the only true and great God who had previously revealed himself to Moses. And the song praises the Lord in, uh, for the ways. God has many ways to bring about deliverance for his people. But he praised God for the ways he had triumphed, triumphed, not just triumphed, but triumphed gloriously over Pharaoh and all his little enemies, his little army, which was a pretty, I shouldn't say little, it was a pretty amazing, uh, powerful army of the day. But no, no match for God. The Bible says a horse and his rider. The horse and his rider were, were overtaken. And so although the forces were considered at that time the most powerful military force of that era, they, they, they couldn't hold a candle to the Lord, who was almighty and is almighty. The power of the Lord is beyond comprehension. 
He's, he listened to this. He's sovereign. He's in control. And then in the second verse, we see liberation. Liberation only came uh, by the strength of the Lord, not of the people, not of how they planned. And it was an engine in this engine in, in genius and in, ingenuity. No, no. It came from the strength of the Lord. See, before crossing the Red Sea, Moses commanded the people. He told them something. Now, it, it looks kind of rough out here, but I want y'all to stand still and I want you to see the salvation of the Lord. This is Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And so then the song removed any possibility of misidentifying the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is the single objective of the Israelite worship. No other God beside him, no other God equal to him, no other God, period. He is the only true and living God. And for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the people of Israel would exalt God, exalt the Lord for what he had done for them. Very much the way we should do right now. The Lord has done so much for all of us. Class, we cannot tell it all. So in just, but in just a few weeks, a few days later, after, after they were delivered, the Israelites had faced their first real military conflict against the Amalekites. Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 to 16. And the Old Testament kind of talks about and describes the Lord as a div divine man of war. Now there were times when the Lord came in and, and worked alongside the people during the battle. There were other times when the Lord said to them, and I'm going to say this in, 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 in the current day language, I got this. Don't worry about it. Listen, hey, look, y'all going on. Just, just relax. I got this one. This one right here is on me. So that time the Lord fought for them himself. I want you to read Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1 through 4, and Exodus chapter 14, verse 14. So then the Israelites had something they had to do. They had to trust and they had to believe if he's done it once, he can do it again. And isn't that a message for all of us in class today? If he's done it once, can he do it again? He's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. And listen to this. Ain't nothing too hard for him. He made the heaven and the earth by his great power and stretched out arm. And oh, Lord God, there's nothing too hard for thee to do. So that's what they had to do. They had to trust and believe. So, so, so God, had, God had not called his people to fight against flesh and blood. Like right now, we, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting, we're fighting against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Listen, it ain't personality, it's principality. So we, we get that twisted. We think it's the, the personality, the man, the woman. No, no, it's the principality, which this is a spiritual fight, and we got to get ready for it. At the end of the day, the Lord, is going, the Lord had already promised his people that all the enemies of God, including death, will be destroyed someday. I want you to read Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. In verse 11, this verse contains what's called rhetorical questions, two of them. And these two rhetorical questions really highlight who God is and how special God is and how unique God is. The Egyptians had worshipped a whole lot of false gods, male, male gods and female gods, that they made, and they worshiped those gods. But this, this question that, that, that Moses asked, this rhetorical question that he already knew the answer to, look what he said, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Don't y'all answer that. Uh, we already know, ain't nobody like him. And so then he already knew the answer, so look what he said. And look what Jeremiah 10 and 6 says, there's none like the Lord God. There's none like the Lord God. There's none anywhere, any place, any position of power and authority like the Lord God. So then the question builds on the, the second question of these two really builds on the first one by distinguishing the ways that the Lord cannot be compared to any other God. How so? Glorious in holiness. What is that? That's moral, moral purity, 
undiluted, uncut purity, absolute perfection. Ain't nothing imperfect about the Lord. He's perfect in every way. So then for, for human beings to be fearful in praise, as we see uh, in the text here, implies the utmost respect and honor for the Lord. And not only that, a willingness to follow what he said do, to follow his commands. I want you to read Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 12, and also verse 20 and 21 in that same chapter. We see the word wonders. The wonders of the Lord, the Lord's work, were in full display when he opened up that Red Sea. Had this Red Sea standing up like walls. And it, apparently the, the Lord changed the foundation of the sea. Wasn't a whole lot of mud and rocks and all this stuff. He made it where they can cross on dry land. God is something else. We got history of what God has done for his people down through the years. In verse 12, we learn this. In biblical times, when you, when you heard the right hand, are being located on the person's right side, it conveyed something. It conveyed blessings and it demonstrated prestige and it revealed power. Let me say it again. It conveyed blessings. It demonstrated prestige and it revealed power. I want you to read Genesis chapter 48, verse 17 through 20 and 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19 and Psalm chapter 20, verse 6. So in this case, the right hand celebrates God's victory over the Egyptians on behalf of Israel, the Israelites. God would fight on our behalf. Sometimes, I mean, just think about it now. Just think for a few minutes about times in your life where you know there was nothing else you could do. You couldn't hire no defense attorney. You couldn't hire no, you can call no physician. You couldn't call no best friend. You couldn't call nobody. If the Lord didn't get it done, it would not happen. And he did it for you. And we tend to forget about what he's already done before. The Bible says also the earth swallowed them. And this, this part of the verse seems to look way down the road, a pretty good ways, to when Korah and 250 rebels were swallowed up. When the earth opened her mouth and just swallowed them up. Rebellious people. I want you to read Numbers chapter 16 and verse 32. So like it was now, like it was in the Egyptian, it was a sign. It was a sign of God's judgment on wickedness and his deliverance of his people. You see, we can't get wrong. We can't do wrong and get by. You know, and sometimes we feel we, we feel we're going to get away. OK, I got by, so I'm going to get away. I'm gonna, I got away, so I'm going to get by. Well, don't be deceived now. God is not mock. Whatsoever man sowed, that shall he also reap. So these, these folks had done some wicked things and God dealt with them according to their wickedness. In verse 13, God redeemed the people and then took them back as his own people. No longer the property of Pharaoh. You know, slaves back in the day, back at that time, African-American, we, we have that in our history. Slave was, slaves were property of the master. And so they were property of Pharaoh but they was chosen of God. Now, now let's, kind of let, let's think about that for a moment. They were property of Pharaoh at a time, but then it was chosen by God, set free and delivered. So after, the, after redeeming the people, the Lord led them then to the holy habitation, translated in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and 25 as the tabernacle, the city of Jerusalem. I want you to read Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 20. So God, so God then was leading his people to Canaan land, away from, away from Egypt to the promised land of Canaan. I want you to read Genesis chapter, chapter 17 and verse number eight. The New Testament presents Christ in the New Testament as our redeemer. Why? Because he paid the price on Calvary's cross. He paid the price to set us free from the slavery of sin. Sin had us bound. Now we're no longer bound. No more sin, no more holding me. It's a blessing. It's just a blessing. And my soul is resting. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We are free because of what he did on Calvary. Now, keep this in mind, too. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. We are bought with a price. We're not on our own. I want you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 20. So you see, this old world, then, is not our home. 
all of us are just pilgrims passing through in my father's house, is what John said in chapter 14. Are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I'm going somewhere. I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. This old place down here is temporary. And, and so don't, don't, get, don't get real comfortable because you got a private jet, you got a, you got a house up north, a house down south, you got uh, plenty of land, you got uh, large accounts that's in place and you got large brokerage accounts and you got large retirement accounts and annuities. Hey, you gonna pass that stuff going to somebody else. Now I'm, saying, I'm not saying it's wrong to have it, I'm not saying don't enjoy it while you're here, but if you're born again and five baptized, you got Jesus on your mind, don't get settled with that because God's got something a whole lot better on the other side. And while you enjoy it in the here and now, but there's some on the other side that this can't even compare to. In verse 17, the song acknowledges the establishment and that establishment would came from the Lord's work when he planted them. The Lord planted them in the land of their inheritance. It had been promised to Abram in Genesis chapter 12 in verse six and seven and then confirmed to Moses in Exodus chapter 6, verse 2 through 4. It would be the place of God's blessings, God's blessings for his people. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. And sometimes uh, we get out of place, and God has a place for our blessings, and, and, and things go real good and real smooth, and things come together. There's a certain synergy and energy. There's a certain logistics that moves real good, when we're in the place that the Lord has bestowed his blessing upon us. But we got to learn to lean and learn to listen to the Lord. We see the word mountain in this verse. The mountain probably refers to God's holy hill of Zion, as indicated in Psalm chapter uh, two and in verse six, and many other verses that refer to that as well. So hundreds and hundreds of years later, centuries later, Solomon then was gonna come and build a temple on this same mountain, it's called Mount Moriah. And there are many churches that are named after Mount Moriah. In verse 18, this verse repeats the song's main central theme. What's that central theme? The Lord is all powerful. Not some powerful, God is all powerful. And unlike these rulers on the earth that have term limits, four years, eight years, whatever it may be, or until they die. The Lord is going to rule forever and ever. He's going to rule his people forever. He's going to reign and rule. He don't live inside of time. He lives in eternity. Eternity has no end. And that is the God that we serve. He's always in charge, always in control, always sitting on the throne, a place of authority. This God is the one that we have on our side. In verse 20 and 21, Miriam one of the women was one of the women that among a whole lot of other women prophetess. And some men have a hard time with that. I don't understand why. I don't know what, why they're tripping over that. But I want you to read Judges chapter 4, verses 4, 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 14, Nehemiah chapter 6, Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 14, to see some other examples among a few, among others, of women prophetess. But at one, time, at one point, Miriam had uh, gotten misdirected and she spoke against the man of God, her and her and her brother, Aaron, because Moses married an Ethiopian woman. You know, see, that's a black lady. And so Miriam said, what in the world, what is going on? God can speak to us like he speak to him. What in the world he's doing marrying this black woman out here? This is, well, y'all don't like that word, right? Ethiopian. Look it up. They, they, they do not have pale skin, okay? <laughs> I put it that way. And so she, she spoke against the man of God and she was stricken with leprosy. But rather than Moses saying, that's what you get. You ought to keep your mouth, you talk too much. You got a big mouth, you just talk too much. You don't never shut up. He didn't go through all that. Moses prayed to the Lord for her and the Lord healed her seven days later. Now she had to go through something about seven days with that leprosy. But the Lord, he prayed to the Lord and the Lord healed her. That's the, see, that's why everybody can't, can't pastor. Everybody can't lead people for the Lord because you hold grudges. Y'all hear what I just said? Any, if a pastor holds a grudge, he is so immature. He don't need or she don't need to be pastoring nobody. He need to go and get back in the choir, 
sit back in Sunday school class and get some more teaching. Now, now listen, that's just the truth because folks going to make you mad. They're going to say stuff to you. And, uh, okay, uh, that's enough on that. I'm going to leave that alone. So he prayed for. I want you to read Numbers chapter 12. Read the whole chapter of Numbers chapter 12 and see what, what, what happened there. So at, at that time, at that time also, after all this had happened, it was normal for women to just celebrate the Lord uh, for different kind of different occasions with, with tambourines and they danced. They praised the Lord. I want you to read Psalms, the 150th division of Psalms, verse number four. There was a reframe, the reframe or the repetition of the, the words uh, of the song was celebrated on how the Lord cast Israel's enemies, their foes, into the sea. And it appears here that Miriam that, that spoke out a term that ended up getting leprosy that the Lord healed was the, the main one that was leading them in praise. So she led the women in praise and uh, they, they repeated it like a rendition. Rendition when, when, when one group answers another group in, in a song. You've seen those kind of songs. So the words are, the words, these words are a final reminder of how the most powerful nation in the world was no match for the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Lord God Almighty, El Elyon, Adonai, Elohim, Jehovah Jireh, was no match for God Almighty. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, he knew everything, he everywhere at the same time, and he got all the power. Who, I mean, who's going to compete with that God? And you know what's good about it? I, I want to give you some good news now. Every now and then you got to remind people of the good news. The good news is that God is, what is on the inside of us, the spirit of that God, the Holy Ghost, the paracletus, the go-between, the walk beside, the talk to, the counselor. That God is on our side, leading us and guiding us, directing our path, ordering our steps, telling us what to say, what not to say, where to go, what not to go, what to do, what not to do, giving us in, in information, instructions, and strategies. If we only stop and listen. And that's something we all got to work on, class. I raise both of my hands. We got to learn to stop, look, and listen of what the Lord is saying to us in this hour. I'm so glad, I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm so glad I'm born again. I'm so glad I'm fire baptized. I'm so glad I got Jesus on my mind. I'm so glad that my family is saved. I'm so glad that he's been such a wonderful savior. I'm so glad that he's never, ever lost a case, never lost a battle. And I praise him and I glorify and magnify his holy and righteous name because he's God. He's, he's, he's sovereign. He's, he, he's supreme. Ain't no representatives or senators over him. And he don't need a vote. Uh, he, he is the vote. He can swear by no other, so he swore, swore by his own name. Uh, this is the God that we serve, and he is absolutely, positively amazing and beyond comprehension. So every day we should say to him, thank you, Lord, because you've been so good to me. Thank you, Lord, because you brought us from a mighty long ways. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, your kindness. You've been mighty good to us, Lord, and we, would, and we appreciate all you've done, all you're doing, and all you're going to do. Hey, look, class, we're out of time. Y'all have a great rest of the week. We look forward to seeing you again next week for our next Sunday School Review. Y'all take care.